But we begin tonight with a perfect illustration of how rights are taken away in this country. How do you take away something that people enjoy as a right? Um, option one, the most direct option, is to try to make that thing illegal. But if it turns out that you are treading on people's constitutionally protected rights in order to try to make this thing illegal, then the courts, of course, will stop you and you'll be left with fuzzier options. You could try persuading people not to do this thing you disapprove of. You could try persuasion. You could try scaring people. You could try threatening people. Or you could go about making it so difficult to do the thing you disagree with that even though you can't technically outlaw it, you can de facto prohibit it by making it almost impossible for anyone to do it. That last option is a very effective means of eliminating rights in America, eliminating them even when it's illegal to technically take that right away. The Washington Post is reporting that the crusading, super conservative, increasingly high profile attorney general of the great state of Virginia has declared now that the state can begin regulating first trimester abortion clinics. Because the anti-abortion movement chased abortion services out of many hospitals and doctor's offices, it is a service that is largely provided in specialized clinics now. And right now in Virginia, these clinics are regulated in the same way as other offices where patients receive other forms of outpatient services, places like places where you get oral surgery or, or, or plastic surgery. But under the crusading attorney general's new legal opinion, clinics that provide abortions could instead be regulated like hospitals. In which case, according to abortion rights groups, 17 of the 21 abortion providers in the state of Virginia would probably have to close their doors. If the attorney general got his way, those 21 clinics would be newly required to be no more than 15 miles from an emergency room. In most cases, their hallways would have to be widened structurally in order to be able to fit two gurneys through the hallway at once, even though they don't generally use gurneys. They would need to have swinging doors installed in all of their doorways. None of this has anything to do with abortion services. None of this has anything to do with providing abortion services more safely. It's all because the state of Virginia would be requiring clinics to operate as if they are hospitals, which they are not. Now, it should be noted that just because the state's attorney general, Mr. Ken Cuccinelli, uh, says this is how he interprets the law, just because he puts out a legal opinion claiming it's suddenly okay to regulate abortion clinics to death, that doesn't mean it is the law. He's issued his legal opinion, but as attorney general, he has a lot of leeway to do that. Back when he was a state senator, Mr. Cuccinelli consistently supported bills that would have done exactly what this new legal opinion attempts to do, it would force abortion clinics into hospital style regulations. But none of those bills ever passed. So having failed to actually change the law through democratic means, he's going with what he sees as his next best option. He's just declaring that the law is changed anyway in his opinion. And that particular page out of the playbook is one that we've seen before. The approach to restricting constitutionally protected rights is a road that we've been down before. We know where this road, in fact, ends. Once upon a time, the country was introduced to another crusading, national spotlight-seeking, super-duper anti-abortion attorney general. His name was Phil Klein. Like Mr. Cuccinelli, Phil Klein also seemed frustrated at his inability to just make abortion illegal in his state, in Kansas. And so he, too, took matters into his own hands. He decided that as attorney general of Kansas, he was just going to go after abortion rights by any means necessary. Like Ken Cuccinelli, crusading attorney general of Kansas, Phil Klein, started off by issuing a legal opinion, an opinion he thought would help him in his crusade to stop abortion. He attacked abortion in Kansas by using child abuse reporting statutes. He used child abuse reporting statutes as a means of getting his hands on the medical records of women and girls who had undergone abortions. So he could search for evidence of some sort of wrongdoing within those records and then prosecute abortion providers. That was his plan. As part of that fishing expedition, Phil Klein and his underlings subpoenaed guest records from a hotel near the clinic that was run by the late Dr. George Tiller. They then compared the subpoenaed information from the hotel to medical records that had had names redacted from them. They, can, they had gotten those records from the state with the names re removed, but when they compared those records to the hotel records, they figured out how to identify patients who had had abortions by name. 
Thanks to that particular operation, Phil Klein's office put together a list that allegedly included the names of 221 adult women who had had abortions. Eventually, those medical records and others they had managed to collect over time were traded around like baseball cards. On Phil Klein's way out of office in 2007, there was sort of a mad scramble in his office to decide what to do with those records. Naturally, they weren't just going to leave them behind. They were so valuable in the anti-abortion wars. They apparently thought they might still be able to use them or maybe get some other local district attorneys to be able to use them somehow to try to stop abortion. So these private medical records that were obtained in the first place under shady circumstances involving a hotel record subpoena, they were stored for a while in the assistant attorney Attorney General's garage. Then they spent 40 days in a Rubbermaid tub in another staffer's apartment. And at one point, these private medical records were all photocopied by a member of Phil Klein's staff at a local Kinko's store. As you might have imagined, by the very fact that we are talking about this, the whole operation in Kansas sort of blew up. There were big repercussions for Phil Klein. Not only did he get voted out of office as attorney general by the good people of Kansas, he's now under investigation for alleged ethics violations. He could wind up losing his law license. Just last week, one of his underlings, who also faced ethics charges related to this anti-abortion crusade, was publicly censured by the state board in Kansas that is in charge of disciplining attorneys. And of course, Phil Klein never did manage to fulfill his dream of prosecuting the late George Tiller for providing abortions. But if you think about the overall point here, Phil Klein's crusade didn't entirely fail. The overall point of what Phil Klein was trying to do was to take this constitutionally protected right away from women, law be damned. To use the law as an instrument to take away a legal right. Now the effort legally failed. But to an activist like Phil Klein, the law was not really what's important here. What was important was the outcome. In Kansas, the outcome was, at least in part, that the private medical records of 221 women who had had abortions were photocopied, including their names, in full view of anyone who happened to be hanging out at Kinko's on January 8, 2007. The result is that every woman who has had an abortion or thought about having an abortion or who thinks she might someday need an abortion will now have to wonder whether she will be followed to a clinic or to a hotel near the clinic by crusading anti-abortion activists from a state attorney general's office, whether her medical records will get passed around by people who think of private medical records as opposition research. That's why Phil Klein's campaign against abortion in Kansas wasn't a complete failure because he succeeded in making it seem harder and riskier and scarier to get an abortion. It is a long and messy road, but that is how constitutionally protected rights are taken away in this country. And now in Virginia, Act Two. Joining us now is Tarina Keene, Executive Director of NARAL Pro-Choice in Virginia. Tarina, thanks very much for your time today, appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Rachel. Let me first ask you about this legal opinion that's been issued by uh, your state's attorney general, Ken Cuccinelli. It mm -hmm. is the strategy um, to make it too costly for abortion clinics in Virginia to stay in business? Oh, absolutely. Uh, he's been trying uh, to do this for many, many years, uh, especially while he was in the state Senate, uh, at least for eight years, and he did so unsuccessfully. So now he's simply trying to circumvent the legislative democratic process and uh, is, is, is doing this through this opinion and is giving the power over to the Board of Health. Why is it that regulating abortion clinics as if they are hospitals, telling them they essentially need to abide by all the same regulations that a hospital needs to abide by, why is that such a hardship for clinics? Why would that have the effect of shutting clinics down? Well, if you think about your typical doctor's office, most of them are rented facilities and they're very small. Uh, they're not hospitals. And if you had to retrofit uh, an, an existing office, whether you own the building or you don't, you're talking about 1.5 to $2 million a year to, or I'm sorry, 1.5 to $2 million total to actually have that retrofitted to become a small uh, hospital or what we call ambulatory surgical centers. And you were the source of the quote to the Washington Post that in your estimate, of the 21 clinics that provide abortion services in Virginia right now, you think that 17 of them would be shut down if this went into effect? Oh, absolutely. These are small facilities uh, that simply could not meet these guidelines. And it's 
really sad because abortion is already very hard to access in Virginia. 86% of counties and towns in the state of Virginia do not have an abortion provider. And many of these facilities also offer reproductive health care, uh, other types of family planning services. And, uh, and also some of them are used as uh, general practitioners offices. So if they shut down, we're talking about a lot of women losing their only access to health care. Tarina, let me ask you about this in, in the broader political context. Mm -hmm. um, Phil, Phil Klein in Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, Bob McDonnell in Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli in, in, in Virginia, these are politicians who, Republican politicians, conservative politicians, who made their vociferous opposition to abortion mm -hmm. part of their campaign for office. Crusading yeah. anti-abortion politicians are very common um, on the conservative right right now. Uh, on the other hand, Crusading for abortion rights, to protect a woman's right to choose, is something you hear very little about, even from very progressive Democrats who are running for office. Do you think that Republicans have been able to sort of steal this debate? Would it help to have Democrats campaigning on this issue? <laughs> I would like to see that. Um, I think, unfortunately, it has become such a, a difficult issue to talk about. Uh, they have hijacked the language. And uh, unfortunately, what, what they've also done is they've made people feel like uh, abortion is is dangerous and it's also scary. Uh, so uh, it's hard for uh, a, a pro-choice candidate, whether they're Democratic or, uh, or Republican, to actually talk about this because it's so easy uh, to uh, listen to the rhetoric of the other side and, instead of actually really giving it some thoughtful analysis uh, as to why people are pro-choice and what that actually means. That means comprehensive sex education. That means uh, uh, access to family planning, uh, birth control. And if we had those two things uh, in order, uh, we could reduce the numbers of abortions in this, uh, in this country and in the state of Virginia. But no one even wants to talk about that either. Uh, it's a very difficult issue. Tarina Keene, Executive Director of NARAL Pro-Choice in Virginia. Thanks very much uh, for joining us tonight and helping us give this story a national spotlight. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rachel.